Hi everyone. Uh, today we're going to get into the actual application of Newton's second law. Uh, what we're going to be doing today is mostly going through a few different styles of force problems where the goal is to find the outcome acceleration or sum of forces on an object. We're going to work through a lot of basic problems and you'll see a lot of examples today in the main video, but I encourage you to also check out the example videos that will be appearing on the YouTube channel. The thing that we'll be covering today is sort of basic force uh, f equals ma. Uh, we'll explore how to deal with angles and inclines. We'll look at the ropes and pulleys in the system, introduce some friction, and then finally deal with springs in the system. In the second part of this unit, we'll get into more complicated examples such as coupled accelerations, non-uniform accelerations, and non-uniform circular motion to kind of draw this all together and complete our treatment of forces. But for now, let's get going with some basic applications of F equals MA. Let's consider what happens if we have a cheese wheel. It's sitting on top of a scale inside of an elevator. Classic physics experiment. I hope you get to do this in lab. Um, if that elevator is traveling upward at a constant speed of two meters per second, what does the scale read? And for these problems, I'm going to make the math a little easier by taking g to be 10 meters per second squared. Well, let's use the method. First, I'm going to define a y-coordinate that is going upward uh, here. And therefore, uh, I have to ask, what is the acceleration? Well, it's a constant speed of 2 meters per second. So the force, or so the acceleration is 0. And therefore, the sum of the forces in the vertical direction are zero. Well, what forces are involved? I'm going to examine the cheese. There are two forces that are acting on it. We have the force upward from a scale. That's the normal force. And then we have the weight pulling downward of gravity on the, on the cheese. And so in the coordinate system I've defined, which is y is going upward, then the normal force uh, is uh, positive mg is negative. I'm using the coordinate system is going in the negative y direction. So we write down the magnitude of the weight is minus mg. So n minus mg is the zero acceleration. And I can just solve n equals mg. And so that's 150 newtons. Well, that tells us how hard the force on the scale is pushing upward uh, on the cheese. But I want to know what the scale read. Well, this comes to a model that we will use here in physics, which is scales are measuring the magnitude of the normal force that their surface exerts. So it's simply saying that the scale reads n. Whatever normal force the force of the scale is pushing up on, that's what it's going to read as its measurement. Okay, let's do a slightly less trivial uh, example, which is the same cheese wheel, but now we are accelerating upward at a speed of two meters per second squared, uh, what does the scale read? Well, in this case, I'm going to do uh, the same thing uh, as before. I'm going to set up my free body diagram with the normal force and the weight on the cheese. I'm going to define my coordinates to be y direction is upward. We know that the sum of the forces in the y direction are going to be the mass of the cheese times the acceleration in the y direction, which is specified in the problem. And so we know that the normal force minus mg is equal to the mass times the acceleration. It's accelerating upward. If it was saying accelerating downward, I'd put a negative sign on the acceleration. Uh, but I've defined y to be positive in the upward direction. Hence, the magnitudes work out. And so what I'm solving for remains the normal force. And so that's mass, uh, the weight, times the mass times the acceleration. I'm going to hop on down underneath here. And so the normal force is equal to the mass times g plus the acceleration is equal to 15 kilograms times the gravitational acceleration, 10 meters per second squared, plus 2 meters per second squared. So that's 12 times 15 or 180 newtons. So if the elevator is accelerating upward, the scale is going to be reading a higher value of 180 newtons. Okay. 
Now, sometimes I just want to go on a little sidebar here very briefly. Um, sometimes your physics book or other discussions will refer to what is the apparent weight of the cheese which is sort of what it see what the scale reads or something like that or it will discuss things that are weightless um i find these to be imprecise and sometimes misleading and so i'm just going to uh in this class typically refer to weight is the force of gravity usually from the earth on an object therefore something that is weightless only becomes true in the deep space between galaxies where the gravitational field is essentially zero I prefer the term free fall. So in uh, space, you are often in free fall, but there is plenty of gravity around. Uh, and that's going to be very important for uh, understanding uh, things like orbits and things. Finally, uh, the apparent weight is what I will simply call the magnitude of the normal force exerted by the surface of the scale on an object. Uh, I'm just going to call it the normal force. Uh, so I don't like to use apparent weight because it's just not uh, like weight is the force of gravity and uh, I prefer to avoid sort of the modifications on it. Okay the next uh, sort of key example that I'd like to do is uh, this one where I consider two blocks of masses three and five kilograms respectively uh, being pushed with a constant force of 40 newtons. The blocks remain in contact during acceleration. I'd like to know what is the acceleration of the system and what is the magnitude of the contact force of A on B and what is its value. Uh, so uh, here we have this setup and I want to sort of go through all of this in kind of the gory detail finding the acceleration and the contact force. Now Sometimes in physics, you're sort of taught a different route for uh, doing this problem. I want to work through it using the method um, because that way uh, I won't accidentally screw up our existence at some point in the future. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider my uh, two blocks here where I have a block and I have A and I have block B. I know that the mass of A is equal to three kilograms. The mass of B, deceptively uh, smaller, is five kilograms. And we're pushing on this whole system with a force, and that force has a magnitude of 40 newtons. Okay, so with this as our setup, what I do is I draw, I first set up a coordinate system. I'm going to set up the one that was sort of shown previously, where this is the x direction, and this is the y direction there. And then I'm going to Construct free body diagrams. So first for object A, and on object A, there are a bunch of forces. So there is a the force that's actually pushing on it. So I'll call that F. There is the weight of object A. That's shown here. That's the mass of object A times G. There is the normal force that is pushing upward from the table to keep object A where it is. And, well, that looks like it might be it. So we'll go on to object B, right, saying, well, how is object B moving? Well, it has a normal force. Uh-oh, there's two normal forces. So what I'll do now is I will put a little subscript on the normal forces to keep track of them. There's a weight, that's MBG. And then we say, what is... Uh, accelerating this. Well, there is a contact force of object A pushing on object B. So I'm just going to draw that as F of object A on B. That's making it go forward. Ah, so at this point, alarm bells are going off in my head because I have two objects and I have a force between them. And if I have a force between them, this F of A on B, the other free body diagram must contain the Newton third law pair of force. So it's the force of B on A, and it's equal in magnitude and opposite. So I'm going to draw that right here. So it's pointing in the opposite direction of FAB here, and I'm going to call that F of BA. And I'm going to note that the magnitude of FAB 
is equal to the magnitude of FBA. And so without the actual vectors uh, attached to them, I will say that F of AB is F of BA, and this is magnitudes only. Directions are opposite. That's going to be important because I'm going to write down some equations now. I got myself some coordinates, and uh, I'm going to assert that we don't really care about what's happening in the y direction. This is an x problem only. So I'm going to write down the sum of the forces in the x direction for object A uh, over here. And so I can look at that. I have to find the positive x direction up here uh, to be to the right. And so uh, then the force in the positive x direction is F. So I'll write that down as F. And then in the negative x direction, we have FBA pushing. And so I use the negative x direction by writing down the magnitude of force with a sign on it indicating that it is going opposite my plus x axis. So that's F of BA. Okay, so that sets up my uh, first equation. And then that's equal to the mass of object A times the acceleration. Uh, object B is going to have a very similar uh, set of forces. So some of the forces in the x direction for object B is just going to be the force of AB. There is nothing going backwards, and that's equal to the mass of object B times the acceleration. Now I'm going to use the equivalence of these and these two equations to solve and figure out the things that I need to know. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take the FAB and substitute it in for FBA because those two magnitudes are equal. And so then I'm going to say that F minus MB times the acceleration is equal to mass A times the acceleration. And then I can solve and I sign that force is equal to the mass of A plus the mass of B times the acceleration, or then the acceleration is the force over ma plus mb, which is equal to 40 newtons over uh, 3 kilograms plus 5 kilograms, which is going to be equal to 5 meters per second squared. We want to pause here for a moment and just note that sometimes your physics teacher may have instructed you to say, if you have a system like this, you can kind of treat it as an aggregate system, consider the force that's pushed on it, and say this is force over the total mass of the system, and that gives me the acceleration, and find the acceleration that way. That's correct in some cases, but the fine print on that will sometimes screw you. And so be careful uh, when you're doing this. Um, and uh, sometimes you will get in cases where you actually have to care about different forces acting on A and B or additional contact forces between them, in which case this whole system will not work nearly as nicely as uh, you would hope. So uh, given that, what I would like to do is carry on to figuring out the magnitude of the contact force. Well. That, oops, that's F of AB is the magnitude of the contact force. It's just the mass of B times the acceleration uh, coming entirely from this equation right there. And then that is 5 kilograms times 5 meters per second squared is the 25 newtons. Problem solved. Okay, uh, the next problem. I'd like to introduce is that of an amoeba. So I have an amoeba sitting here on an inclined plane. Uh, it has a uh, mass of one nanogram. The angle is 60 degrees, diagram so very not to scale. And I'd like to know the magnitude of the normal force of the ramp acting on the amoeba and what is the acceleration of the amoeba down the ramp. So those are our two goals in doing this. And uh, this is kind of a classic problem of something sitting on an inclined plane. Uh, I'd like to start out by constructing a coordinate system for the amoeba, and I'm going to choose a coordinate system that is parallel and perpendicular to the amoeba's plane of motion. So I'm going to pick an n 
t coordinate system. This is our wonderful way of using that where there's a tangent component and a normal component along and perpendicular to the plane of motion. And so that's going to give me a lovely coordinate system where I can carry out my f equals ma. Uh, I have a force on the amoeba, uh, or I have some forces on the amoeba, and I'm going to write down the free body diagram for that. I have two forces. I have the weight of the amoeba, mass times g, and then I have a normal force. And that normal force is acting perpendicular to the surface of the plane, normal force. And if I then want to decompose this into my nt coordinates, so I'll draw those in red to indicate that they are coordinates and not vectors, I'm going to have to do a little bit of trigonometry. So at this point, we can do that math. Um, we know how this works. Uh, this is our diagram. Uh, we need to kind of break down uh, this weight vector here into the nt coordinates. And so the geometry of this is that the uh, dotted triangle that I'm drawing here and the overall blue triangle are geometric in the sense of, or similar in the sense of geometry. So there is a similarity relationship uh, between them. And so I want to figure out how to relate the angle on the plane to the angle between the vectors and the NT coordinate system, which is kind of drawn along these two legs of the triangle. And this through doing the argument that this is theta and this is the complement of that angle and these two things are similar, we can figure out that the angle here is going to be 90 minus theta. And so this triangle here, this other angle here must be theta. So there's a little geometric proof that allows us to walk the angle around and find out the right direction here. Uh, but I always like to solve this by kind of imagining a limiting case. And if I imagine the limiting case, I can sort of figure out what happens if the ramp's angle changes and it got smaller. Then you ask of these two angles, the theta or, or the angle here and the angle here, which one also gets smaller? And so in my mind, I always consider this limiting case of it's going to sort of shrink down here. And as this angle gets smaller, this angle gets smaller. And so that's going to help me when I'm doing my geometric D projections to make sure I always get the right angle. Okay, let's return to the uh, problem at hand where I am then trying to decompose this into NT coordinate systems. So I'm going to be considering the vectors projected into this and the normal force is already in that coordinate system. That's why we picked it. The normal force is shockingly in the normal direction. But then the weight is going to have to decompose into two components here. There's going to be a component in the normal direction and a component in the tangent direction. And we just argued that this was theta uh, based on the geometry of the problem, and that's the same value as this theta here. And therefore, if I consider my trig, this component here is going to mg cos theta, and this component here is going to mg sine theta. Then we can write down our uh, force relationships. So the force of the sum of the forces in the normal direction is going to be the plus direction is going to be the normal force, and in the minus direction is going to be minus mg cos theta. By the constraints of the system, the uh, amoeba accelerates down the ramp, so its normal acceleration is zero, so it's going purely in the tangent direction. So this is zero, so that means that my normal force is equal to mg cos theta, and then I can plug in the values here. So that is one nanogram, which is 10 to the minus 12 kilograms. So a nano to a kilo is 10 to the nine, and then another three orders of magnitude. So that gives me 10 to the minus 12 kilograms. G is 10 meters per second squared. And then the cosine of 60 degrees is a half. And so this comes out to be five times 10 to the minus 12, or five 
let's draw that five like a five pico newtons pico being 10 to the minus 12. okay uh then we want to know what the acceleration is down the ramp that's the sum of the forces in the tangent direction uh there's only one force that is m g sine theta and so that's equal to the mass times the acceleration in the tangent direction and so then I can cancel out the masses. Red, mass, mass. And so the acceleration in the tangent direction is just going to be G, uh, sorry. Uh, boop. Eh, eh. So the acceleration in the tangent direction is G sine theta, which is 10 meters per second squared times the sine of 60 degrees which is root 3 over 2 or uh, about uh, 0.87 multiplied by 10 gives me 8.7 meters per second squared okay uh, so this sets up a common ramp problem that we like to see and explore a lot okay uh, we have a few more cases to consider here uh, the last one is uh, these pulley systems. And so what I'd like to know uh, in this case is uh, a scenario where uh, we wanna solve a problem like this. Consider this pulley system, which is being used by somebody to raise a big bag of wasabi peas, 100 kilograms, uh, upward at a constant speed. What is the magnitude of the force they are pulling on the rope with? Well, uh, this is a kind of interesting problem to start because there are um, this uh, system here. And I want to analyze it in a little bit of detail uh, because these pulley systems can get kind of tricky. I want to consider this uh, rope here. Uh, if I'm pulling down on it with a force F, that means that throughout the rope, there is a tension force that's equal to F. So everywhere along here, there's a tension in the rope that is equal to the force. So that's what I mean. The magnitude of the tension is equal to force. And I want to start by analyzing the forces on this pulley system here. There is a tension here that is not the same rope as this rope that's running along here. So for this pulley, so let's consider the pulley. Oops. That pulley, I have a tension, two, a tension force. On this side of the tension force, or this side of the pulley, there's a tension force up. And on this side of the pulley, there's also a tension force up. So there are two, oops, there are two tension forces moving upward t and t there is a second rope here that's actually pulling on the wasabi peas and i'm going to call that tension t2 so it's pulling down with t2 that pulley is massless so for the pulley the sum of the forces i'm going to be clear that this is the plus y direction is going upward. So some of the forces in the y direction is going to be that the 2 t minus t sub 2 is equal to the mass times the acceleration of the pulley. Pulley is massless, so this is 0. And so therefore, 2t is equal to t sub 2. So this uh, rope right here has a tension in it that is twice the force. Um, so let me go ahead and say that T2 has a magnitude of 2F. Next, I want to consider the free body diagram on the P's themselves. That has T2 pulling up, F, or sorry, MG is pulling down. The sum of those forces is going to be zero because they are moving upward at a constant speed. So we know that T2 minus mg is equal to zero so t2 equals mg and so that's 2f that's equal times mg i know what uh the mass of the wasabi peas is and so f must be equal to the mass of wasabi peas 100 kilograms times the acceleration due to gravity 10 meters per second squared all over 2 or 500 newtons so that is a way of solving it.
So what's kind of neat about this, uh, and is the reason why people use pulleys, is that pulling on one end with a force F uh, is going to end up pulling upward on the wasabi peas with a force of magnitude 2F. And so that allows us to double the force that we're pulling upward on these wasabi peas, and that's basically why there's a field of engineering. So, moving onward. I want to consider what happens if that system is accelerating. And so this is a case where we have to pay a little bit more attention to what's happening to two objects in a system uh, where they're linked by a pulley system like this. Well, um, that's kind of uh, tricky because uh, this rope here is moving at kind of a sort of constant speed through here. But then this the wasabi peas are going to be moving at a different rate than the cow, uh, or a different magnitude, and certainly in a different direction. So I'd like for you to consider here is what happens if the wasabi peas move down. There we go. Go wasabi peas, so move down. So if the cow moves up by some displacement delta y, then the peas are going to move down by some displacement delta y over 2. And that's because this rope here is going to get shorter by some distance delta y, but then that slack is going to be taken up on both sides of the pulley equally. And so that's going to divide the slack uh, into two parts, some over here and some over here. And the net effect of that is that the peas only move down by a height of delta y over two. So we know that the time derivative of delta y, the two time derivatives of delta y give me the acceleration. And so that means two derivatives of the peas acceleration are going to give me an acceleration that is half the magnitude of the wasabi peas. Uh, or sorry, the wasabi peas are going to have a magnitude that's half that of the cow. And so to be kind of clear about what's happening, I would mathematically have a relationship that the acceleration of the wasabi peas is going to be equal to half that of the cow. And if the cow moves up, the peas move down. So there must be a negative sign between them if we are considering everything in the uh, vertical direction only. Okay, so we have the idea of constrained accelerations, which we'll explore in a little bit more detail as we go. All right, the final thing I want to talk about here. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another exciting video here in Physics uh, 144. Uh, today's topic is we're going to get into discussing dynamics. This is the second part of the dynamics unit, and the main thing that we're going to be focusing on here is different types of forces. So the previous lecture covered kind of our basic forces, gravitational forces, normal forces, tension forces. Uh, here in this video, we'll be going over a couple different cases where we have special models for our forces. And those are friction, a fluid force, and then the spring forces. And then we'll talk about how those apply in the context of circular motion. So without further ado, let's get started with the friction forces. So friction forces arise whenever two surfaces interact. Uh, these are generally solid objects that we are seeing uh, uh, connect with each other. And at the microphysical level, what's happening with friction is uh, we have these two objects, and in a very small level, uh, there's all these little bumps and wiggles, these imperfections that kind of create uh, the surface itself. And at the atomic scale, those are very rough. There's a bunch of atoms and small features going up and down. And these small features end up creating small polar regions 
in the uh, material. And polar here in the electrostatic sense, meaning that they have a sort of net charge by kind of shaping up and having nuclei from atoms push up in one direction, and those are kind of crunched together, so the electrons are forced away. And so there's a slight polarity to these, uh, these bumps and wiggles on the surfaces of the uh, on the surfaces, and then when one surface slides against each other, those uh, polar interactions electrostatically interact with each other, or they just have straight up normal force collisions, uh, like we discussed last time, where we have these electrostatic interactions there. Uh, friction is delightfully complicated. It's an incredible, uh, incredibly difficult study to a uh, subject to study uh, because. You know, you think rough objects have high friction and then smooth objects should have sort of lower friction, but then it's weird because if you actually smooth the objects too much, they get sticky again. And this leads to a process called vacuum welding, where you go into a vacuum, you clean off a couple pieces of metal so that there's no oxides on the surface of them and stick them together. And if you take two perfect surfaces and stick them together, how do the atoms know which object they belong to? And it just becomes a single object. So this is a really weird small surface physics uh, uh, is a bizarre corner of physics, but it's amazing, and so it uh, gives rise to the study of friction. We're not going to deal with super complicated models of friction. We are going to deal with a far simpler thing, and we're going to assert what we call a model. And so models are a mathematical representation of how we're going to describe friction. And it is something that is good enough to give us some interesting physics. And if it cannot explain the uh, model or the behavior that we see, it's a bad model. And we're going to have to go ahead and revise it and develop a new idea. The model we use for uh, friction is to say that the friction force is equal to some coefficient, which is just a number, times the normal force. So that's basically how hard the object is pushing into the surface describes uh, how hard that surface is pushing back on the object, and therefore it gives some scaling for how uh, much friction force there is. We're going to start out by describing kinetic friction. Kinetic friction is what happens when one surface is moving with respect to another, and this leads to a friction force that has a vector form of the coefficient times the normal force times the tangent vector with a negative sign. This is implying that forces uh, from friction are always opposed to the direction that the object is moving. So this is uh, a negative uh, opposite direction of motion. The other friction force that we will deal with is a static friction force. And this represents the friction force that happens when uh, two objects are at rest, or two surfaces are at rest with uh, respect to each other. And we have this sort of sticky model uh, for friction, which is that static friction provides exactly enough force to keep an object motionless with respect to another object until you reach a certain threshold at which point the friction can no longer maintain it in that equilibrium uh, position, and then it will kind of break free and start sliding, at which point kinetic friction will take over. So uh, let's kind of view uh, what these physics models look like by examining one of these physics education tutorials. Okay, Ooh, this is a spring. Here's uh, some friction force. And so I have a little uh, object, uh, person who is pushing on an object that is at rest. Uh, we have a nice um, st stiff block here, and we're illustrating the forces here, and we'll give it lots of friction. And so when that person pushes on this object here, the static friction force is going to keep it in place. So notice the friction force is always balancing the applied force, and that'll be true up to a certain level, at which point it breaks free and the person starts to accelerate the object. And the harder you push, the more acceleration there will be. And then you can let go, 
And then the kinetic friction force is opposing uh, the motion and causes the object to slow back down again. So you'll notice what happens uh, here. I'm going to put on the values so we can sort of see this in detail. You see the forces grow and grow and grow. And when the object breaks free, I want you to pay attention to the magnitude of the friction force as it gets larger, and then suddenly it drops back down. So typically, the coefficient of kinetic friction, or how much friction an object experiences when moving, is actually going to be smaller than the maximum force that's available under the static friction. So what we can do is we can put uh, some more objects on here to increase uh, the force required, even to a point where the person cannot move it because uh, the friction force is so high. Uh, we can turn down the amount of friction, and then they will, uh, that's the coefficient of friction, and then we will get the same behavior as last time. As the person pushes harder, uh, the object starts to move, and then the friction force will oppose the motion. So we have a very basic model for what the friction force is doing. So returning here uh, to the mathematics of this, uh, we have these coefficients here, and uh, we saw this behavior where that coefficient of static friction was defining the maximum force that an object would experience, would just be mu s n. It's an important point, I'm going to yell it about this and get all enthusiastic, which is that the static friction force does not always equal mu s times n. It is whatever is required to keep it in equilibrium up to that limit. So there's that less than or equal sign right there to give us that point. Okay, final thing is whether objects are undergoing static or connective friction, kinetic friction. So if you have two surfaces that are moving with respect to each other, that's kinetic friction. If they are not slipping or sliding with respect to each other, that's static friction. And the big point here is something like a car's tires. The tires are not slipping, under good circumstances, with respect to the road. And that means that the, the car's tires are applying static friction and not kinetic friction under this uh, basic model. So here's some examples of coefficients of friction. You'll notice that on average, the uh, coefficient of static friction is larger than kinetic friction. That's that sort of force gets larger and then kind of breaks free component of the model. Uh, smooth surfaces like Teflon have very low coefficients. And then very sticky surfaces like rubber on concrete, the kind of thing you want your tires to have, have very high coefficients of friction. Okay. Uh, so we can do a little bit of uh, an example here. So let's consider uh, this case here, which is a wooden block that is traveling on a frictionless surface uh, at v naught until it encounters a wooden ramp inclined at an angle theta to the horizontal. And we want to know how far up the ramp will it travel, and we'll use uh, a kinetic friction model because the wood block is moving with respect to a wooden ramp. Okay, so let's switch over here to do a little whiteboarding. And whenever we get this, we want to consider the case of a uh, block here on the ramp. And so we're going to start out by solving dynamics uh, case by establishing uh, a, well, first we draw a free body diagram. So when the, uh, uh, when the block is on the ramp, it's going to have some forces on it, like its weight, which is mg. It's going to have a normal force that will keep it move, uh, from falling through the ramp. And so that's going to have magnitude normal force. And then it's going to have a kinetic friction force on it that's slowing it down. And that's going to act down the ramp because the velocity vector is pointed up the ramp. So we have this as our free body diagram. I'm going to set up a normal tangential coordinate system, nt. And that means that as I look at uh, this um, free body diagram here, I'm going to grab and move my mg over here because I need to construct uh, the, uh, well, I need to break down the mg vector into my nt coordinate system. So in this uh, 
So our reference NT, T is in the opposite direction of kinetic friction force. The normal force is in the direction of the normal component uh, of the acceleration. And then we are going to break down MG into this coordinate frame. And we've chosen this coordinate system because more of the forces, the normal force and the kinetic friction force, are aligned with it, and uh, only mg is not already in that coordinate system. So that makes it like a good choice because we have to do the smallest number of trig decompositions. So then uh, I'm going to go ahead and break down mg. Uh, this, com this angle here is theta, and so this is mg cos theta. Uh, in that direction, and then this uh, vector component down here is going to be mg sine theta. And so the sum of the forces in the normal direction is just going to be the normal force is pointed up, mg cos theta is pointed down, and the surface constrains the object to not move with respect to the normal direction. It doesn't fall through the ramp or go sailing off of it. And so I'm going to set that that's m a normal, and that's going to be zero because the normal acceleration is zero. It stays on the surface. The sum of the forces in the tangent direction is just going to be mg pointing down the ramp and fk pointing down the ramp. And so that's minus mu k times the normal force minus mg sine theta and that's going to be equal to m times the tangential acceleration and here we have the basic algebra of a force problem which is we have two equations and we don't know the normal force and we don't know the acceleration and we want to find the acceleration by eliminating the normal force so i'll use the top equation uh, to solve and find out that n is equal to mg cos theta, which I will then substitute down here into the second equation. And then I'm going to get that minus mu k times mg cos theta minus mg sine theta is equal to mat. So carrying on with our solution here, uh, the first thing I notice is that there's an M in every term. There's one there, one there, and one there. So I am going to aggressively cancel that out. Cancel, cancel, cancel. And then I have a solution for my tangential acceleration, which I will just rewrite here. And I'll just say that A sub T is equal to pull out a G, and that's mu K uh, cos theta, plus sine theta, and there's a negative sine in front. So it uh, has that magnitude with this combination of trig terms. And now I want to answer the question, how far up the ramp will it travel? Great news, everybody. This is a constant acceleration, which means that we are able to fall back on our kinematic equation. And the ones that I want to solve or uh, use is that uh, the final velocity squared minus the initial velocity squared is equal to two times the acceleration times the distance up uh, from where it started. So it's going to be xi and xf. So this difference here is what we want. This is what we want. That's how far up the ramp it travels from its initial to its final position. Its final speed is going to go to zero because it's at rest. And therefore, I can solve that, uh, in this case, x final minus x initial, what we care about, is equal to negative vi squared, uh, which is given as v naught in the problem, great, uh, times 2 times the acceleration, which is negative g times this mess of trig, mu k cos theta plus sine theta. Pull that all out, close the brackets, cancel the negative signs, and we get that it's uh, whatever the initial, um, I'll sub in v naught for the initial speed. Uh, so 2g times mu k cos theta plus sine theta. All right, fantastic. We have figured out how far up the ramp it goes. Okay, uh, so. The next thing that we can consider is a different kind of friction.
Uh, this case, it is fluid friction. Now, fluids are an amazing study. It's one of my favorite corners of physics. And we have to worry about fluid resistance. The obvious kind of resistance that we worry about is air resistance. But I'm going to start out with a slightly simpler model. Uh, and uh, for certain types of fluid where we have relatively low speeds or very viscous thick liquids, so these are things like oils or corn syrup or something like that, high viscosity fluids, we can have a force model, remember, like friction, it's a mathematical model that's good enough, which says that the drag force uh, on an object is just equal to some coefficient k times the velocity vector with a negative sign. So previously we asserted it was a coefficient times the uh, normal force. Uh, this coefficient carries units because uh, a velocity times something has to give us a force and it depends on the shape of the object and the properties of the fluid. And uh, this particular model for the aficionados in the audience is the um, called the Stokes drag after the uh, scientist uh, Stokes. And so this is just sort of showing that as if a fluid is moving past a spherical object, it experiences this kind of drag force, uh, which they call big F here, and I've called little f over there. Now, uh, it's kind of an interesting model uh, because we also have a case where we have high uh, speeds and low viscosity uh, fluids. And when that happens, we get a property of fluids called turbulence, which starts setting in. And oops, uh, let's see some turbulence. Uh, and so this shows uh, the kinds of behaviors that you see in a fluid pattern uh, as an object on the border of starting to have turbulent fluid flow. You get these really interesting vortices and whirls. And then as turbulence sets in, it becomes completely chaotic and a mess. And so this happens for objects that are moving quickly or in fluids that have low uh, viscosity, kind of like um, air. Uh, it tends to be low viscosity fluid, and so we see a lot of turbulence as objects move through air. In that case, we use a force model that says that the drag force is some coefficient, again, times v squared, again, operating in the opposite direction of motion. So this one depends on the velocity squared, and then the Stokes drag only depends on the velocity. Uh, or sorry, this is the speed squared because it has no direction. I've included the direction with the tangent vector, unit vector, and a negative sign. Uh, the drag coefficient d is what tells us uh, the co uh, it is uh, set by the fluid and the, largely by the shape of the object. And it's kind of cool because with these systems, you can actually set up a force balance. And you can basically say, at what point does something like an object falling through this fluid achieve a force equilibrium so there are no longer any accelerations? And we call this a terminal velocity. So if we drop an object into a thick, heavy fluid and it experiences Stokes drag, it will speed up because the weight is pulling it down, showing that here, until it reaches some maximum speed where the drag force balances the weight. And you can just say that the drag force equal, uh, balances mg, so set up this particular uh, force diagram, and solve for what that is, and we get what is called the terminal velocity, which depends on the weight of the object, and then this k, which is fluid properties and object properties. So k is something that I have to specify in the problem if I want you to uh, solve it. Okay. Uh, similarly, if we do the same thing for the uh, turbulent drag model, uh, where it goes like velocity squared, you can set that up and find out that it takes the square root of mg over d for uh, that drag model. Okay. Let's talk about springs. So, uh, springs are not mentioned in your book yet, but I kind of want to call them out uh, here because we have a, um, uh, we, we basically have 
a very similar uh, approach to what we have with friction. Uh, so we model our spring forces with something that's called Hooke's Law. It's a terrible name. It's not really a physical law. It is a mathematical model for how a spring would work. And uh, I apologize, but common notation is to once again call this a K. So there's a coefficient in front of it, and that's called the force constant of the spring. And it has units of force per unit distance, where the distance is the length of the spring minus the equilibrium length of the spring. And so if I stretch it, there's a negative sign out here and it pulls it back towards equilibrium. And if I squeeze the spring, uh, that means that X is gonna be less than X naught, this number is negative, And so then it's going to push it back towards equilibrium. So that always means that a spring is trying to get back to its equilibrium length. So I do have a, a force model here uh, that kind of illustrates it using this little uh, cartoon uh, available from the physics education tutorials. And here it is. Uh, so we have uh, this spring here and there are uh, no forces on our spring initially. And then I can sort of push and grab it and push it and pull it and uh, be attached to it. And at equilibrium length, right about there, there is no uh, force acting on it. So I can have my applied force and my spring force and you can't see any of them. And But then if I stretch it, you'll notice what's happening is if I'm pulling back, that's the red force, a spring force acts in the opposite direction of equilibrium. And then you can go the other way and scrunch that spring and push on it and then it tries to restore to equilibrium. I can illustrate the equilibrium position and the displacement here from there, and you can see that the spring force is always acting in the opposite direction of its displacement. So we sort of see how that goes. And then uh, we also have the constant, spring constant K. We can really crank it up and get a big beefy spring and then pull on that, and you'll notice that for a tiny little displacement, we get these huge forces uh, as a result of that. So if I crank this up to a thousand, that means every 10 centimeters I go, I get 100 newtons of force, and if I push the other way, I get 100 units, uh, or 100 newtons gives me 10 centimeters of displacement. If I turn so we have a maximum force of 100 newtons here. If I turn that down to uh, 100 newtons per meter, I can go a full meter uh, because the spring is uh, quite uh, sort of squishy. And so I can change my forces quite easily. And so that constant K indicates how stiff the spring is. Okay, just want to do a quick example illustrating this which says a spring has an equilibrium length of 0.1 meters and a spring constant of K equals 200 newtons per meter. If the spring is hung from a ceiling and a one kilogram mass is suspended from it, how long will it be? So we kind of have a cartoon here where we have a spring suspended from the ceiling and I attach a mass to it. And then that mass stretches the spring downward. So it gets a little bit longer. And it comes to an equilibrium. So initial, and we want to figure out how long this uh, uh, spring is, x, assuming that if there's no weight on it, it has a much shorter uh, spring. M. So, oh, sorry, without m. Yeah. Then in uh, equilibrium, it would have a shorter length that's x naught. So we write down our forces uh, using a free body diagram. We have a spring force that's pushing up. We have a weight that's pulling down. And so then we just say that the force on the in the spring minus mg leads it to equilibrium, so that's zero accelerations, and then I use my expression for the spring force, and the spring force is saying that if the spring is uh, at, at equilibrium, then it's going to uh, basically be pointed upward, and so the longer I displace my spring, so k times x minus x naught, 
minus mg is equal to zero. So as x gets longer, there's going to be a larger spring force uh, pushing up on it. And so then I can solve for my um, uh, x uh, knowing everything else in the equation. So we get that k times x minus x naught is equal to mg. Divide by k, we get x minus x naught is mg over k. And then we get that x is equal to x naught plus mg over k. Then we plug in some numbers. So x is equal to x naught at 0.1 meters, uh, given in the problem right about mm, here. Then we have our uh, mass, which is a solid one kilogram. We have g, which is 10 meters per second squared, because we're on a slightly bigger, better Earth, all over 200 newtons per meter, and is my spring constant. And so then I multiply this out, I get 10 over 200, that's 0 0.05. So that goes to 0 0.05 meters. And when I add those two pieces together, that's 0 0.15 meters and is the answer. A lot better.